Ace, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Ace, uh, is Ace your real name? Middle name. Really? It is, yeah. My my first name, uh, coincidentally, is Riley. Riley Corcoran, the voice of the Grizz. I'm right, but here's the thing. Oh. I know. You guys could play off that though, Riley and Riley. I know. We we see. Here's the thing though. I've gone by Ace since I've been I don't know middle school at this point. It, so it's obviously my middle name. Always been there. But in sports, uh, one of my youth baseball coaches said everybody needs a nickname. Saw that Ace was mine. My middle name. He said, "Why don't we just call you Ace? It makes sense for baseball." Now I was never the Ace of the staff at all. Wasn't that good at playing sports? But uh, yeah, I know Riley, Riley and Riley. Riley I, be, I mean. I, I heard there was a show called Mike and Mike. I know. Pretty I know. successful. We could really have successful. Du- like, ri- we could have duplicated from it. this point on. It's Riley and Riley. I know. Where you- did your parents get the middle name Ace? Because that's rad. I see. I've asked them before. They don't know. They dad just kind of. It was dad's idea. Uh, mom took Riley. Dad took Ace, and that was that. There was where's n- sour wine come from? Is that so that's my mom's name? My parents are still together. My mom kept okay. her last name, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Ace was, he's not a, my dad's not a card player, was never a pilot. He just thought Ace was a cool middle name, I guess. He was right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, speaking Appreciate of it. Riley, other Riley, uh-huh. have you guys collabed on anything? Do you guys ever work together or is it just? Yeah, so we, uh, this year, the show you guys were on just a month ago or so on um, the Daily Drive, he's uh, he's kind of a part-time uh host i would say monday and thursdays he comes on but we do you know coaches show stuff together we've done uh broadcast together like i've provided color commentary for some men's games and vice versa with him on the women's games but yeah we um yeah and then i guess football broadcast too when i'm when we're home i do sideline working with him there obviously he's up in the press box but yeah we work together so there's some potential for some riley and riley there is. That's awesome. There absolutely is. But now I feel like you're too entrenched in Ace. Kind so of, to go back yeah. to Riley, yeah, right now, terrible right? idea. Yeah, yeah it wasn't bad. Idea. That. It's a good okay, idea. Let, let, let's it's edit just... this all out. Just, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's too like it's funny. Pretty much everyone in my family, all my friends back home, they all call me Ace. Oh. I think there's one to two people who actually call me Riley at this point, and and that's half the time like uh, sarcastic. Uh, comment so yeah not many rileys but it is, i mean ace sour one is such a great name for Thanks, broadcasting man. for radio like appreciate that kudos to your mom and dad well done <laughs> they predicted well done. That. yeah they predicted that i'd be in radio someday ace i want to go back in time a little bit and just ask you was there a pivotal moment from your childhood that made a significant impact on what you're doing now like yeah uh 100 um I was, again, it, it came from a different baseball coach. Um, I was in seventh grade. My coach was in college at the time. He was going to school for journalism. He wanted to be a play-by-play guy. He was one who kind of, I guess, gave me the idea that that is a, an actual job that you can do. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. I, I love sports. I always wanted to do stuff in sports. And I he showed me some of his clips, what he was doing. Uh, UW River Falls is the university he was at. I was listening to him like, this is a, wow, this is awesome. From there, that was kind of where it started. I always wanted to do it then. And, you know, when I was young, you're playing Madden or the show. And I was the dork who was sitting in front of my TV playing the game, but also commenting. You know, I would turn the audio off and I would, you know, my quarterback throws a pass and I would call it out on uh, on my video games. So, yeah, it uh Middle school is when it started around there. Did you have like a favorite commentator play-by-play guy growing up that you emulated your voice and your cadence after? So what's, I don't know if I consciously tried to copy any of them. Um, I'm sure I did though. Like I, I think you just absorb knowledge without even knowing it by just listening. So Bob Euchre, he's the uh, voice of the Milwaukee Brewers. He was for a long time, uh, radio guy, him for sure. Wayne Larravee, radio guy for the Packers, Matt LaPay, guy for the Wisconsin Badgers. So all the Wisconsin voices, really. Um, nationally, though, I mean, growing up, Al Michaels was always there. Uh, as much as Joe Buck got hate, I love Joe Buck and will not stand by the Joe Buck hate, frankly, especially nowadays. I think he was boring at one point. But yeah, I, I don't know if I necessarily tried to copy any one guy. I think there's pieces now that I pick a pick from, like Kevin Harlan. 
he his his wordplay is out of this world. Like he comes up with ways to describe a play that I would never think of. Um, the same with Doc Emmerich, uh, NHL announcer who is retired now. But they their words and the way they describe stuff is again just I wouldn't think of it. So you pick up stuff along the way, you know, like little words or little cadences. I think, but I don't try and consciously copy anyone at least. Ace, you mentioned there regionally, Wisconsin, Green Bay, Milwaukee. What is the the tie, the fascination with the state of Wisconsin? So I'm from there. Okay, I'm from River Falls, Wisconsin. It's uh, actually it's even closer to the uh, Twin Cities, uh, Minnesota, really than it is Milwaukee or Green Bay. So it's west side of the state, but um, yeah, I guess it started. Family was just they were Packers fans, Brewers fans, Badgers fans, and I probably just followed in their footsteps and yeah, diehard Packers fan to this day brewers as well, but yeah, home state kind of, I don't know, following, I guess, if you will, what would be a better day for you, a Packers super bowl or a brewers world series win. So the Packers are my all time favorite team, but I've already seen a Packers super bowl. And if I see a brewers world series, I don't know if I could actually comprehend it because they were awful. Like when I was young, they went 26 years without a playoff appearance. So thinking of those days, like they're good now, year in, year out. I still don't think they're ever going to win the World Series. So for that reason, if they did, I'd probably go Brewers just because I wouldn't know how to comprehend it. And I would 10 times out of 10 cry if that happens, if it ever, which it won't, guys, it won't. What was life like growing up, Wisconsin? What, what's your parents' background? What'd they do? What? Yeah, I wish they were broadcasters like <laughs> nepotism. Maybe give me in like a Joe Buck uh, yeah. or uh, Ian Eagle, Noah's son, uh, or I should say Noah Eagle, Ian's son. Uh, but no, my dad, he is a blue collar guy. He's been a maintenance um, tech and supervisor pretty much my entire life. Uh, he's worked at a couple different uh, facilities. My mom, she worked at this, um, it's called biodiagnostics. They did a lot of like agriculture stuff like kind of sciencey side of it um i don't even know how to describe but now she's retired and she uh just hangs at home but yeah uh, again i wish one of them was a broadcaster would have made this path a lot easier <laughs> were they athletes into sports did they kind of give that to you or did this come they were into sp- they're into sports for sure uh mm-hmm. the athletic side they probably gave me my athletic genes too i don't think any of us are all that athletic but we love sports and we follow it but yeah no no true real athletes in the family unfortunately so your dad being kind of a blue collar guy when you come to him and say dad i'm i'm going to go down the journalism yeah. sports caster what was that conversation like? He was loved he for it. it. He loved it. He loved it. Uh, for I think for a number of reasons. He so I have three other siblings. He had them very young. So I think in a way, he I don't know if he lives vicariously through me, but I think he wanted me to do whatever I wanted because his life was kind of stinted because he had kids really young, and it 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 went from you know I do all this traveling and I. And following this dream of broadcasting, he didn't really have that opportunity because he needed to settle in and find financial stability and provide for three kids. So when I told him, uh, yeah, I want to do broadcasting, he said, yep, go for it. We are behind you 100%. Mm-hmm. When I told him I'm coming out here for this job, he said, go for it. You're chasing a dream. And again, frankly, when I came out here, it wasn't the smartest idea. Like I left a full-time job to pursue this Lady Grizz deal. And yeah, I don't know if I would ever recommend what I did because I don't think it was smart at the end of the day, but it's chasing a dream. And so far it's worked. And I imagine you don't regret that not decision one bit. loving what you're doing. Not one bit. When when did you know that broadcasting was your future? When did it actually become more than just playing Madden or the show, but actually have some legs? So I would say in college I got a I got an internship in the Northwoods League. It's a summer collegiate baseball league in in the Midwest. And it's a really good league. I mean, a lot of great Major League Baseball players have gone through there. Um, Max Scherzer, Curtis Granderson. uh, I know I'm leaving a couple out too. I mean, Nick Fortes, who is on our team. He's currently the starting catcher for the Miami Marlins. So it's a really good league. When I got that internship, that felt like the first validation that there's something there. Cause yeah, I was doing, you know, college radio stuff and that was good too. And it was a great start. But when I got the validation that, okay, you're good enough to be one of the top, you know, uh, 
18 broadcasters, I think, in that league at the time. I was like, okay, there's something here at least. Uh, but then my my broadcasting career and honestly life kind of went up and down. I moved to North Dakota right out of college. COVID hit, screwed up a lot of things, as we all know. And I, I mean, I almost gave up on this as a full-time effort. And I just said, I'm burnt out from it. Kind of want to step away. What is something that normal people, normal people, <laughs> people that aren't in broadcasting misunderstand about how hard it is in this business? That's a good question. Uh, it's, in, it's incredibly difficult. And I think broadcasters are often judged by big plays and how they provide that comment. Like I, I point out Freddie Freeman's grand slam on Friday. Joe Davis is on the call. He has an all time, like he, 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 he pulls the Vin Scully. Like he almost had the same exact cadence, the same call. And it's incredible. Like that's going to go down as an all time moment, but, and that's what broadcasters will get remembered by Al Michaels saying, do you believe in miracles? Yes. Like they're remembered for those moments, but there's so many hours and, and prep work that you might not even get to on a broadcast. Like you might come up with a random stat or a nugget for player X. And that might never come up. So you're like in a way you're wasting a lot of time during the week because a lot of this stuff might not even get into the broadcast. But to be, I mean, really good. Like I, I always get like, how do you remember players' names? And I'm like, it just kind of comes with practice and actually getting to know them and talk. But there's countless hours that goes into it that, again, might not even show up on the broadcast. So I guess that would be, yeah, the short answer. So did you go to school for journalism? Yep, broadcasting. Journalism. Where'd you go to college? UW River Falls. So UW Whitewater, my first year, and then my hometown, UW River Falls. Uh, I went there the last three years. Okay. And then then you landed that job in the yeah in the baseball league out of school? So that was during, the baseball league was during my junior year of college. Okay. Right out of college, it was uh, North Dakota, small, small radio station up there. Okay. And then where'd you go from there? So it was up to Oaks, North Dakota for two years. Very small town, like crazy. Sm- I, I'm not from a big town, but this town is like 2,500 people. And I, man, for a 23-year-old single dude, not the place to go, guys. <laughs> not the place to go. But I'm actually grateful for it. Uh, and then I moved up to Jamestown. Um, I was only there about eight months because that was when COVID hit. And I just wasn't right mentally. I didn't like what I was doing. So then I went back home uh, to the Twin Cities for probably about two years before I came out here. Still in broadcasting Twin Cities? Part-time. It was um, just through a couple of local TV stations. I would do some games, but no, I got into uh, recruiting for jobs because I I thought I was done broadcasting forever or at least full-time, but uh, yeah, I still was doing it on the side. Kind of was fun. And how did this opportunity come up in Missoula? How did you hear about it? And then you said this was kind of a dumb decision to take the leap, but uh, walk us through that. So Learfield is this nationwide company that they're affiliates of a bunch of universities, including Montana. And they're they're always the one that has the broadcasting rights and the marketing too. But so I went on Learfield's website. I looked up every single property they had, started with A, and I think it was Alabama, like the University of Alabama, I think was the first one. And I went through every school and I just emailed their GM and said, hey, uh, looking to get back into broadcasting full time. Do you guys have anything open? Most of the time, nobody replied. Sometimes someone said, yeah, I mean, we'll keep you in mind, but nothing right now. Montana hit and I got a call from the guy who oversees all of the hiring at Learfield. And funny enough, he's like, hey, first off, stop bombarding everybody because when you email those guys, they just email me. So I probably emailed this guy, maybe not directly. But I probably emailed him, I don't know, 60 times at least. And they're going like, hey, if you ever need a guy. And he's like, yeah, I've gotten this freaking resume probably 60 times at this point. But he, so he joked about that. And he said, we actually do have something at the University of Montana. And I said, oh, OK. And I talked to the GM here at the time. And uh, it was a very part time gig, not something you can really survive on. But I said, let's do it. Um, the reason I say it's, it wasn't smart because I had a full-time job back in the Twin Cities. Life was stable, but it just, it, it wasn't, I don't know, fun. I didn't have a passion doing the recruiting stuff. So it wasn't smart in the sense of, yeah, I left money on the table. I left stability on the table. I'd move out here for 
you know, I think it was really like 11 grand a year with the Lady Grizz. And living in Missoula, as everybody knows, it's impossible to live here as is, but try doing it on Did 11 you know an hour. I knew. Did so you when know I, how expensive Missoula was? When I talked to Riley, uh, he was one of my interviews, I guess. He, I mean, he mentioned like, I just want you to know, we want you here, but it's going to be tough. And funny enough, I kind of lied to my boss too. The, my old boss here at Learfield in, the, in Missoula. And I said, yeah, I'm going to keep this recruiting job. I'm going to do that full time. And then I'm going to do the Lady Grizz part time. That was never the case. I was going to leave the recruiting job, but I didn't want to say to them that, yeah, there's a, you know, I'm going to have only 11 grand a year. Cause I feel like when you're hiring somebody, like, why would you hire that guy? Like, okay, that's going to be really tough for you to live out here. So yeah, I completely lied to him and said, uh, <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to work full time still. So don't you worry about my finances. We're, we're golden, man, but uh, I still don't regret it. I don't regret it. <laughs> uh, I want to come back to your story. Let's go to our rapid fire questions. Okay. Steven, you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, I'll kick us off. Let's go. Rapid fire number one. Ace, what was your earliest memory of Missoula? Um, man. I guess the only the, the first memory I have is literally pulling into town. That was the other thing. I'd never visited Missoula before. So the first memory I have is is getting off of I-90 and So you accepted uh, the job before ever coming out here. Yeah. Again, stupid. I know. <laughs> Not the smartest in moves. Did you know anyone from Montana? Had you heard of the Montana Grizzlies or was this totally So I knew the Grizz because of their two men's basketball NCAA tournament appearances. Um and I knew that Grizz football was a, a good FCS program for sure, but I always followed the Big Ten. So it's not like I was I was in the know about Missoula or the the university here. So what yeah, what was that first memory? Pull off the interstate. I get and- just kind of, I like seeing uh uh, what is it? Thunderbird motel. Like, I guess that was my first <laughs> sight. And I was like, Hmm. Okay. All right. Drive to my apartment, start unloading, went over to lady girls practice and met the coaches. And yeah, after like an 18 hour drive from, from Wisconsin, you know, Thunderbird. Yep. Thunderbird motel. I guess that's the first you can memory. Stay there with making 11 grand a year. <laughs> you can get a room. That's true. That's true. We could. What is your favorite coffee spot in Missoula? Ooh. I'd go with uh, Drum over by uh, Sentinel because I used to live over there and I would just walk there and uh, yeah, we'll go Drum. Favorite restaurant? Mm. Favorite restaurant? You count Mo Club with the burgers? So, yeah. Do you have to say that? Yeah, as a, contractually. You know, is that <laughs> I don't, I swear. As I'm wearing my Montana football. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, actually, I'm going to change it. I'm going to go Flippers. Flippers. Just Ooh. the only reason... It's because Flippers has fries. I think burgers, I might go Mo Club, but Flippers is 1A, 1B. That is a first. We've not had Flippers on the podcast really? before. Yeah. yeah. Have we? Nick Jackson. Nick Jackson. Oh, Jones. you're right. We I like did. this guy. Good I like memory. Nick Jackson. Good yeah. memory. <laughs> fooled me. What zip code do you live in? Uh, 59801. From your perspective, Ace, what is the weirdest thing about Missoula? Uh, I would say the mix of um, people and backgrounds, which it, it's not terribly weird to me because like when you live in a city like Minneapolis, St. Paul in the Midwest, you get a very uh, strong mix, so like political mix. I mean, here, I, I think you have both very hard leaning liberals and very hard leaning conservatives as mm-hmm. well, like same thing back home. So I don't it wasn't necessarily like a culture shock to me, but I do think it, there's just a weird mix of. You know, people that live in the middle of nowhere that come into town, meeting the the college kids that are 21 and the exact opposite end of the spectrum. So, yeah, I'd say the the mix of people and backgrounds. What do you love most about Missoula? Uh, it's hard not to say the the love for the Grizz because not only do I work for him, but I, you know, I get to experience it on the field every Saturday afternoon home game. Uh, I've compared. Washington Grizzly to Lambeau Field multiple times. The fan bases between the Grizz and the Green Bay Packers, like one of the best fan bases in the NFL. They're very similar. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to go with the the Grizz and just the love for the Grizz here. Ace, is there a particular book that you've read that has made Ooh. a significant impact on your life? So Al Michaels, his uh, biography, autobiography. I always forget what what one means. Uh, 
whatever the book about the Al book Michael. about yeah. Al Michaels. <laughs> he just he had he has so many incredible experiences between the Miracle on Ice earthquake that shook the World Series and I forgot what year it was, but out in Oakland, um, a number of Super Bowls. He covered Olympics overseas. He's done you know weird sports like downhill. What is it? Uh, motocross, like on ice, like stuff like that. Like, I just think you can't find a better career and, and thus like for me, a better life to live out than what Al Michaels did. Walk me through, let's start here. What all you're you're in Missoula. You came here for Mm part-time job. Was that with the lady Grizz? That's where you started. Just the lady. Grizz. What all are you doing today? So, and this is one thing that I, you know, I hope it doesn't come off as bragging, but I do brag about because I'm incredibly proud of what I've done here. It started with the Lady Grizz. Uh, I, then I started doing part-time radio work with Town Square Media here, doing uh, morning news on KGVL. That eventually grew into a full-time job where now I'm the brand manager of our country stations. I still help out a little bit on KGVL. And then I host uh, our sports show Monday through Friday, the Daily Drive on KGRZ. So I mean, that alone it's fleshed out into this full time job, and now it's it's enough to support me. But then over at the university, I'm doing sideline reporting for football, pre and post game for football, all on the radio. Um, then on ESPN Plus, I'm doing soccer. Pretty much done every home game of theirs. I do most of the volleyball home matches now on ESPN Plus. And then in spring, uh, I'll do softball too. And I think that covers it. And you're still doing Lady Grizz? Yep, still doing Lady Grizz, yeah. Wild. I know. I'm um, not bragging at all. That, you're very good at what you do. <laughs> Thanks, and, I appreciate uh, it. It makes complete sense that you're doing all that. How do you keep that all together? Uh, especially So this month, November, brutal. I mean, I, I just next week, for instance, Monday, the Lady Grizz bust to Spokane. Uh, I got to do my regular radio work and try and get ahead of that this this coming weekend. But then when I'm in the hotel, I still have to do you know certain you know sports updates, and I have to do my show from the hotel, which will be weird. We haven't done it yet, so I'll see how that goes. But that's Monday, Tuesday, Lady Grizz play Gonzaga. We bust back after the game. Won't get into Missoula probably until what two three a.m. Then Wednesday starts the Big Sky Conference soccer tournament. Doing both of those matches on Wednesday, the semifinals, two more matches on Friday, championship on Sunday, and then plus football on Saturday, home game against UC Davis, very late one. What is it? Eight thirty start, eight fifteen start, uh, and then on top of it again, I still have all my regular radio station, you know, nine to five tasks to do. I mean, it's really tough. That's been the biggest difficulty is finding the schedule of how to get everything done and do all my prep to the point where I get on air for a game and I feel comfortable. There's been times where I haven't had time and I just, I'm short of my, do you, prep. Do you work better under pressure? I mean, does this, does a, like a week, like next week, does that fuel you motivate you? Does that, do you just love it? And you're in the moment that week or I do, I do love it. I don't know if I, I don't know if it's better in terms of, um, prepping and and just doing a better job. I do love the 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 fast paced action of it, but I don't know if I do better or worse. I'm not really sure. Okay. Listen to the games and let me know how I sound next week. You guys can be I, I don't the have judge. Time to listen to eight <laughs> games next week, guys. All right, uh, all right. So do this for me. Uh let's say Lady Grizz have a home game tonight. What does game day look like for you? Uh so shoot around in the morning. Uh, home game shoot around starts at 7:30 a.m. So I'll get here or over to the university right around then. Uh, I do my interviews for the night. So I talk to Coach Holsinger, talk to an assistant, talk to a player, and that does pregame. Uh, let me start. Let me interrupt you right there. Yeah, go for so it. So from a, you know, a, as Stephen calls it, uh, being a nobody. Um, is that what you said? I think he's a normal person. Normal person. No, yeah. sorry. I just I downgraded. Someone outside more, the, I downgraded. the industry. A little more derogative, yeah. but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So say I'm a loser. <laughs> There's this, when you go to that shoot around and coaches see you and they know they got to talk with Ace, do they dread that or is it part of the job or is it actually? Players dread it. Do they? Because yeah, they're 18 to 22 year old girls that I don't think like being on 
<laughs> on on the radio yeah. doing that stuff. Um, I would say right away when I first came here, there's there's a like a feeling out process with the coaches because you just don't know one another. It's not necessarily you don't trust. It's just, I don't know. Like picture when you meet someone, it's not going to be as comfortable as when you two are talking now after knowing each other for so right. long. But you um, see like Holly wrote halftime of an NFL game and the coaches do not want to be there. Yeah. In that setting, no. And by the way, I always go on record. I hate interviewing coaches during games. Sure. So even halftime, we talked to Bobby for football, Coach Houck. Yeah. He is, he's never, and I don't mean this in a bad way to coach Hauk. I think this is every coach. He's never really going to give you anything to work with because he's so locked in that I'm, all I ask him now is one question. I go, coach, your thoughts in the first half. And he does a good job answering that, but you know. So is that purely contractual? Like the coaches have to do I that? I think so. Yeah. Like that's part of the. I'm actually not sure if it's a must or not. It is good to have him on to hear that voice at halftime. I just never. And especially on all those ESPN games where coaches give you the same answer, you could just, it's, it's yeah. copy paste. Right. It's, yeah. You know, we got to play, but we got to execute better. We got to do this better. You're like, yeah, every other coach has said that too. Right. So, okay. Okay. So you go on, you go into morning shoot around, talk, could you say players, coach and well, assistant yep. coach, yep. assistant coach. Okay. Mm-hmm. And head coach, Brian, I, I actually talked to him about 45 minutes before the game starts in the morning. It's just assistant and a player kind of shoot the breeze with them, see how they're feeling, get any final game notes that I can write down. But my prep is usually done at that point. Usually now next week might be a little different where I'm scrambling to get some stuff done, but no. And then the rest of the day, I mean, it's, it's kind of boring, uh, especially on the road. We just sit in a hotel because there's not really enough time for me to go out and see something. Uh, I mean, maybe there is, but typically not. So you just kind of sit around a hotel and I'll be doing the, you know, the other radio work, but now, there's not a whole lot to game day except for shoot around and then get there hour and a half before tip off, talk to head coach, start the pregame. There we go. Roll away. Is there any particular coach or maybe an experience that you've had that went really, really bad? Hmm. Ooh. I don't know about like really, really bad. Uh, coach Houck, I mean, he's, uh, he's known to... I don't want to say bite your head off, but it, we weren't recording. And I just, I mentioned to him at some point, like, oh, I hear that player X is doing pretty good at camp. And he goes, yeah, yeah. Who'd you hear that from? And I said, oh, I, I think I probably saw it on social media. He goes, what do they know? I'm like, uh, fair point, actually, I guess. Yeah, they're not really in your program. He's like, yeah, they don't know. They don't know what goes on in our program. I'm just sitting there like, all right. Fair enough. Uh, fair. I'm not going <laughs> to argue here. All right. Touche. But I, I don't really know if I have a bad, because again, that was just maybe slightly uncomfortable where I'm like, Ooh, okay. Don't uh, mention what I heard on social media to coach Houck. Who's your favorite person to interview that will give you a little mm. bit more than you expect and makes your job a little easier. That's a good question. Coach Holsinger is good. He'll provide a really good pregame interview that where, you know, if we have to get to 12 minutes, him and I will easily, easily hit 12 minutes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'd go coach Hol- uh, Holsinger, Lady Grizz head coach. What is the purpose of a postgame press conference with players? See, and I'm going to kind of go back to the same thought I have about interviews with coaches during games and players. Typically, they're not going to give you a lot. Uh, especially Grizz football. Like I I think those guys are coached and taught. Seems like it. Yeah. Like keep it close to the chest, which I don't blame them. I would do the same, but it is just to give, I mean, it's to get access to the players and you hope you get a couple of quotes, especially, I think it's more for newspaper writers or just writers overall, just to get some quotes to kind of compliment the story right up. They have, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those, my wife often comments just about how stupid post game interviews and conferences are. Yeah. Like, why do they like yeah, they everything else are. in the world is innovating and changing. And that hasn't, I agree. And what, so actually I was texting my friends about this last night, just like any pre and post game show, like you watch on NFL right now, I usually can't stand because it just feels so forced and fake, but you do get some great memes and sound bites. Yeah, you I can. Mean, but I, I like I was watching Sunday night football last night. And it just feels like every answer is canned and they're like forcing like laughter and jokes. And I to me, my number one thing, if anybody ever asked for advice and you shouldn't ask, like ask somebody else, Riley Corcoran, he has much more seniority over me. But if you ever ask, just be genuine, like don't copy 
like you guys asked, like, did you pick up from, you know, anything from your announcers that you grew up listening to? I don't try and copy them because it's never going to work. Like you're never going to be Gus Johnson where you hit that really high pitch sound where you freak out on air. That's not going to work for me. I can't even copy Riley. Like Riley's got his own style. I can't do it. So what I hear you saying is be more like Jameis Winston. <laughs> just D- your, did I say that? <laughs> just do just your be thing. Your, yeah, be right, that's fair. Actually, yeah. yeah, yeah, you dub. Yeah, I mean, why can't that guy that's, do more <laughs> interviews? That's fair. I guess I did say that. Kind of a long way around, but yeah, just be Jameis Winston. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Ace, uh, looking over your schedule and all the craziness you have here—the soccer, volleyball, softball, football all of that stuff. Is this a typical route that most of those big time commentators on Fox or I guess prime, or is this what everybody has to go through? A lot. Uh, And again, unless you are Joe Buck or Noah Eagle, where your dad is already in it and no offense to those two, because they're both, I mean, Joe Buck is one of my favorites and I think Noah Eagle's really good, but they had the, I mean, they have a leg up. There's no way around it. Their dad was in the business, but or an athlete, ex athletes. Yeah, it, or ex athletes for sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I think there's always different paths for everyone, and it depends what sport you're doing. Like if you're a major league baseball, um, number one or number two on a radio team, or if you're on national, typically you're putting in a lot of hours in minor league baseball, and that doesn't pay a lot, and you're doing a lot of busing and all that. Uh, college, you know, I, I think my path is probably similar to a lot of guys. Um, you start as a number two at some school or you start as a number one in a small school and just kind of work your way up. But yeah, I think it's similar, but yeah, it's never, you know, it's so never how, how does a guy based. like Kirk Herbstreet? Cause the, the, the grind never stops. I mean, he's got college yeah, game day. Then he's got a, he's on a flight somewhere to a game that night. And then mm-hmm. he's got an NFL game the next day. And like, you're saying the, like, how does he get yeah, to I mean, how, do, yeah, how, how do guys, so it's always different for is an it, analyst. Is it sustainable? I don't honestly. So I don't know how he does it. I so when conference play starts with just Lady Grizz, when we're doing a Thursday Saturday game game, and let's say like our trip to NAU in Northern Colorado, really tough. Like you fly to Denver, bus to Greeley, bus back to Denver, fly to Phoenix, bus to Flagstaff, bus back to Phoenix, fly to Missoula. Like that alone. Like I get home on Sunday night and I'm just like, I'm tired. Kirk, I don't know how he does it. I now that being said, he gets paid a lot of money. So if I had that check in front of me, I'd probably say, yeah, I'll I'll fly all over. Like that's that's pretty easy sure. to me. But hey, I mean, kudos to him too, because he has to put in a lot of credit. And it always shows like the guy sounds informed, whether it's on Thursday night football or college game day or the broadcast that he does Saturday night. Like he's always on. He doesn't always have an off day. He is a Titan. The the best story this year was Reese Davis when they did game day in Cal. They had to get up like 2 a.m. West Coast time to get ready. He was supposed to just do game day and then maybe some like studio updates or something. I forgot. But then there was a, a an announcer who had to ditch on. I think it was the Cal game that night. Something came up. So Davis had to step in. By the time he was done, he worked like a 24 hour day from getting up at two for game day all the way through that Cal Miami game. That to me is I mean, again, when you're on that stage, would I do it? hundred percent. But I go, wow. That's honestly incredible that he did that. Ace, what is the end goal for you? What do you want to be doing? Great question. I was just going to like, Hey, Learfield and the Grizz, they're not listening right now. Like what, what's the dream? What's next? So I think, I think even Learfield and Riley, they they know my, they know what I want to do. Like I want to become a number one at, if you, if you, if I could do dream school or dream place, it's the university of Wisconsin back home where so Matt LaPay has been doing it for a while. And believe me, I have it mapped out on my, you have a vision board, not necessarily like a legit vision board, but something similar, something similar where I like, I have a 10 to 15 year plan where I think that's going to line up when Matt LaPay calls it quits for Wisconsin. And I, I have all these different scenarios of, okay, would it be, enough to stay here as a number two and show them everything I did, you know, starting this new radio show, doing all these other sports, or do I have to move on to a number one role as a, at a different school, a smaller FCS school, uh, just throwing, you know, like a Eastern Washington or Weber state or something like that, like a size. Uh, I, again, I'm not saying I want to uh, just those, those, 
I don't know. It'd be really tough now that I actually got here and I'm kind of connected to the Grizz. Yeah, living in Cheney sounds fun, Ace. That's the real problem. That <laughs> would Moscow? be Moscow. <laughs> that would also be, I think, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Ogden, I, I, Greeley. See, I mean, and, and I've thought of that though. <sighs> like how, okay, do I weigh career versus life at this point? Cause I got a really good balance here, made some great friends. Yeah. That was the other thing. Like I moved here completely solo. I knew nobody in Missoula now have a really good circle through the university and even friends outside of that. So I go, okay, do I want to uproot it uh, to go to a Weber state like school? Is that worth it? Both personally and professionally. I don't know. It'd be a huge TBD down the road, but I am very happy with where I am at right now. Well, You have a track record for making really good decisions. So (laughs) it's true. Yeah. You never know with me straight from the cuff. (laughs) So say you're sitting across the desk from some young, you know, freshman sophomore in college it's, they're in broadcasting or high school student listening who wants uh-huh. to go in to broadcasting they're they're a young ace they're in front of madden doing their own play-by-play what piece of advice would you give them uh, i know like this sounds awful but i would say you have to really think about it because it's the the slim the chances that i and i think i'm really good at what i do but the chances i make it on fox to do an nfl game or even a college football game really slim like really slim so i would tell him like just know that there is a decent to good chance that you're just gonna have to hustle through minor league baseball through high school stuff small college stuff like you might just have to do that literally your entire career if you want that because there's only so many jobs like there's 120 FBS school, 130 FBS schools whatever we're up to now and not all of them have radio so they're alone I don't know. There's probably a hundred jobs, if that, as a number one guy. And a lot of people want to do this. So I would say, number one, think about if you, if you're willing to put in all that, you know, groundwork really. Yeah. And that groundwork might not lead to where you want to go. And you got to be content with that. And the, I mean, $11,000 as a starting spot for you. Where is the perceived value? Why do you keep doing? what you're doing, what, what are the benefits of being a broadcaster? So, I mean, as a sports fan, you get into games for free. Well, it's not even that you get paid to go to these games. Uh, and I think if you told, you know, a eight, eight year old me that he'd go, that's the best freaking job you could find. That's awesome. Uh, that for sure is number one, but I, I do love, and I I'm stealing a page from just about every broadcaster. It's you're telling a story when you're doing play by play and I love doing that and I think I'm good at it. And it it it's I don't know, personal um it's a word I'm looking for. I guess just validation that I know what I'm doing because I'm really happy with what I'm doing. And mm-hmm. I've done other jobs where I wasn't happy. Like when I moved back to the Twin Cities and did recruiting, didn't do it for me. And I was mentally just not in a good state. Like I was depressed. I didn't like the life where I was at, and I felt like I had no drive, no meaning, and Fortunately, this job came across and now it's the exact opposite. I feel like I have a ton of professional and career drive and motivation and meaning. So, well, I said earlier, you're phenomenal what you do. I mean, you, you make, I love going to a Lady Grizz or Grizz football game and getting in the car and sitting in traffic and <laughs> listen to your breakdown and just Appreciate you. think your insight and you just, you make it enjoyable. Thanks, man. I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable here for a second more than you already have. What is the one thing that you feel like you need to improve on mm. as a broadcaster here in the next few years to get you to the level that Ace wants to be at? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it goes back to prep work. Um, I think I'm still crafting how I prep for a game and it can be more concise. And when I mean cra- or when I mean prep, it's, you know, the stories on players and it's not only numbers, but it's also, it, it's a lot of things. It's points per game. It can be, oh, this player's mom played at Gonzaga. And just knowing that little nugget where something comes up in a broadcast where it makes sense to slide that story in. I think for me, it's just, yeah, it's, it's better prep work, more concise, um, more of a structure to my prep work, I would say. So it's kind of behind the scenes stuff. Um, there's, I mean, there's, you're never going to have a 10 out of 10 broadcast. There's always going to be a, a time when I stumble or ah, mispronounce something, got a player's name wrong. That's going to happen. I can live with that. But I think it's the prep work, the stuff that I can, it feels like I can control more than those mistakes you make on air. Do you have a 
tagline or a, a sign off? Has that been developed yet for Ace? Nope. And I I haven't made it an effort not to, but here's the thing. Like when young broadcasters try and do that, it sounds really tacky. Cringe. Yeah. Yes. Big time. Because again, they hear, um, I'm trying to think of a, like Gus Johnson. It's not necessarily a tagline, but if you ever heard it, like he has this like really high pitched laugh and he freaks out. It's like, wow, you know, like on a Hail Mary, he just loses it. You can't replicate that. If I tried, I would sound like cringe. I would sound like the dumbest person ever because it's just not going to work. So no, I, I don't have a tagline. Corcoran kind of does. Like Riley does and he makes it work. And it's, it's, it's simple though. Like every Grizz touchdown, it's touchdown Montana. So like you, it, that's simple. It's not corny. It's not cringe. He kills it. Like that's a good one, but I don't know if necessarily. But he does it the tagline. same every time. The same Pretty much. fluctuation. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. yep. Kind of like Greg, uh, Greg Sunberg. He's got Yahtzee. People love that. That that's a fun. You know, I don't know if that's a tagline, but he yells Yahtzee on some touch. He doesn't do it every time. Doesn't want to oversaturate it. But no, he he yells it, and people love it. It's fun. But yeah, you, you just can't force it. It's not going to work. Well, if anybody wants to write in or email or text some potential taglines for Ace, <laughs> I'd love to hear. We're going to find you. I'm just looking for one. I can't <laughs> promise I'm going to use it, but I would love to hear them at least. Like, see what they come if, up like, with. We had this whole campaign, and whatever we landed on, like it went to a fan vote. Ace had would, to use live on the air. I would like do one that. Time. I would do that. If that, if that, if this was a contest, absolutely. Just I would absolutely something use bizarre that. and yeah, random, yeah, but had to wrap sure. up. I, so I kind of do like a, a word of the game like that. Like I, I come up with a new word to incorporate in, but again, it's not a tagline and it can be a, it, anything from like an adjective to a verb, but that's as, about as far as I go and trying to like force something I'm saying. All right, Ace. Well, this is uh, getting you out of here. I would feel bad if we didn't get your predictions Mm. on the upcoming Lady Grizz basketball season. Give us some of your thoughts, prediction. How's it going to go? It's a new team. They three starters from last year return, but outside of that, going to be a lot of new faces, a lot of transfers, uh, returning players who have been injured. The big sky is wide open this year. They were picked uh, third in the conference. And I think they've got a, as good a chance as anyone to win it. It's going to be a different Lady Grizz team too, because they used to, the last two years, they've shot the lights out and they've set records from beyond the arc. But this year, I think it's going to be a physical team and a more defensive driven team, uh, which Coach Holsinger wants. And I think they're going to get it this year. A couple of pieces like Tyler McClimate call transfer from Stephen F. Austin. She sounds like she is just the most physical player chippy play like even in practice with her own teammates you know she's I, me too and that's kind of what the last two teams i think have lagged uh lacked so yeah a little more physical they'll be good they'll be in the i'd say top three at least in the big sky but you know you never know dude well, thank you so much for coming in you've got a crazy schedule ahead of you and we'll let you get out here and get on the road but um thanks fellas yeah thanks for taking time coming in you do an excellent job and thanks for making you, get, you guys did a much better job of like welcoming me into this show than I did with you guys. Cause we, we were in the studio and just kind of shooting the breeze beforehand. And then it was like, Oh yeah, we're live in five seconds. You guys are like, what? I remember that. What? It, was, it, was it was very quick. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. It's five o'clock already. We have a, we have a schedule. And it was meet, live. So. Like this week can edit. Live. Like, live radio was nuts. I know, and I didn't, it's so fun. I, I didn't really have many questions cause I, I don't like prepping stuff. Well, scheduling like uh, a lot of questions beforehand. So I'm like, Hey, let's just go wherever well, this conversation this. leads. Yeah, the daily drive. That's what it's called, right? Yep, I got it right. Daily drive, yep. So we, <laughs> Steve and I were on there and it was live and we left and we're outside in your parking lot visiting and both of us are receiving text messages from people that <laughs> just heard you guys. We never get that with our own podcast. We, very rarely do people text us like, sure, hey, listen sure. to this episode. So you're doing something right. Uh, good. Um, Appreciate no, it. No, keep doing it. And uh, yeah, thanks for taking time. Thanks, guys. Go Grizz. What's up, Missoula? This is Nick Bala, producer of the Missoula Podcast. We truly appreciate you hanging out with us as we dive into the stories that make our city special. If you could do us a quick favor and follow the show wherever you are listening, whether that's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, maybe you're watching on YouTube, so hit that little subscribe button. It really helps us out. Head on over to www.themissoulapodcast.com for more information, and we'll see you next week.